Um, we'd like to begin this lecture by acknowledging the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sully Wet'uwet'en people whose unceded land, UBC, Vancouver, and this lunch lecture are situated. Um, Lassa would like to thank our two speakers, Annie Liang and Kwaya Jones. Annie is one of our professors here at UBC. She's a graduate of the Harvard Graduate School of Design and a co-founder of the Eudaimonia Network. Kui is a Haida artist, filmmaker, and curator. She'll be, looks like she's just joined. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to our speakers and we'll have a nice lecture and a short question period afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Cool. Um, let me share my screen with you guys and make sure to share sound because there will be a lot of audio today. <laughs> Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, good. Okay. Um, okay, I guess I'll start. Okay, so thank you to the UBC Sala uh, Lassa Association for inviting us to share our work today. And we look forward to the discussion that will ensue after this lecture. So Kui and I today will present on the topic, Transforming Practice, New Models and Media for Reconciliation Design. We will begin by asking a couple of questions on reconciliation, and then we will move on to the ethos underlying eudaimonia network and followed by um, the process of our work. So what comes up for you when the word reconciliation is said? What is the role of healing in design practice? And where do we even begin when considering all the historical and contemporary atrocities that humans have inflicted onto each other? Is there a common denominator behind events such as the Holocaust, the African slave trade, Indian residential schools, the Chinese head tax, and Japanese internment camps, et cetera? And what about the Syrian refugee crisis? How do we access this knowledge and how do we, um, or who do, who gets to write these histories? If colonization is the norm within our collective history, can we begin to reframe and reimagine the way we engage with these issues? Can we catalyze a movement to shed light, to reconcile relationships between people from different backgrounds? We'd like to propose a new lens to address reconciliation through optimism. Can reconciliation be celebratory, inspiring, transmittable, and dare I say viral? Can visual and cultural spaces be a tool of resistance? Can music be an act of resilience and defiance? So now I wanted to take a look at Janet Jackson's um, made for now video.
So the time is now for us as individuals and as a collective to reimagine everything, how we work, how we play, how we express ourselves as designers, artists, activists, and philosophers even. Eudaimonia creates positivity by transforming conflict through high level human expression. Today we'll be giving an overview of the organization um, works in three parts, the who, what, and how to address reconciliation through design. These sections are further broken into their respective categories. Who describes how eudaimonia is part of a local and global network? What includes how eudaimonia is dressing well-being? And how discusses the models, modes, media, and methods moving beyond traditional practice? Eudaimonia Network was co-founded in early 2019 by a Haida multimedia artist and myself. But even before this, the seed of eudaimonia was planted over 10 years ago in undergrad when I was volunteering my time at a yoga studio. There I met Jim Hart, uh, Haida Carver, um, who was working on the reconciliation totem pole. Now that is up on UBC campus. And then later in grad school, I began to do research on Haida Gwaii and made trips to the island over the span of my time at the GSD. And I even chose to skip my graduation ceremony to participate in the UBC summer abroad trip organized by Martin Lewis. Um, on that trip, I presented my thesis to the Council of the Haida Nation and since then have continued developing the relationships um, with those that I met. Um, so Eudaimonia has now grew and expanded our network to include local Haida youth, curators, artists, um, and an international group of design students, educators, and professionals. Um, and now Kui, my co-conspirator, will share a little bit about herself. Uh, Kui, you're on mute. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm from Haida Gwaii. I was born and raised there. I'm a curator, an artist. I do traditional tattooing. Um, and I've immersed my entire life into understanding the ancient culture that I'm a part of. So it's served uh, me well. You know, I, I dropped out of high school um, a couple of times and kind of just focused on my culture, my art, and the things I wanted to learn. So it's, it's not the, the normal path, but it's served me well in the sense that Last year, or yeah, last semester, I got to co-teach a course with Annie on animation, which we'll be talking about later. Um, but I, I'm I'm definitely dedicated to um, finding ways to build that cross cultural education for people to understand how sophisticated and how beautiful all the indigenous cultures are, uh, specifically Haida, but I've worked with other nations also. And so uh, it's, it's a rewarding path uh, to share with anyone from wherever you are to uh, show how beautiful these ancient living cultures are. Thank you, Kui. So we are a grassroots and I'm organization. happy to be here with you guys today. Oh, sorry. Um, so we are a grassroots organization built on the belief of um, power of inclusivity, diversity, and health equity. Eudaimonia coalesced through multiculturalism, and it is a start to how we can begin to reimagine our and providing spaces that celebrate all identities. We also recognize those cycles of trauma and suffering experienced by groups of people around the world. And still to this day, certain people face tremendous inequities due to systemic racism and our policies that dehumanize certain groups. The hate, fear, and greed that infiltrates our society have spurred people to respond through mass protests on and off social media. These movements stem from a need um, 
as from a society that needs a tremendous amount of healing on an individual and collective level? And how do we begin to provide spaces where people feel safe and free to express themselves? I think it might start by looking into yourself. So traditionally, landscape architecture as a profession has been an expression of power and an act of exclusion. But can design be reframed so our education and practice is based on inclusion? What makes Eudaimonia unique is that we are distinct from traditional design practices um, as we move, operate under a nonprofit model. And we think that um, we need to expand what designers think they do. So the word eudaimonia is a Greek word. Um, it's defined as a contented state of being happy, healthy, and prosperous. And now I'll let Kui share some of her thoughts. Uh, eudaimonia is beautiful because there's this incredible opportunity, like through our last class, we're able to see this multicultural, multi like kind of global community through 13 students come together to uh, dive into an ancient living culture like Haida themselves. It was a beautiful experience. Like I, I didn't really uh, understand humanity in the way that I do now uh, after working with all of these students um because people can transform and a huge part of reconciliation is not indigenous people changing and i think that's the expectation but it's like everyone else changing and educating themselves on how beautiful indigenous cultures are and eudaimonia is an avenue for that transformation that is both kind and beautiful um and and tough you know like our students went through some tough moments but it, it it it's all transformative and I think that's what we need to do is kind of celebrate humanity and celebrate indigeneity even if you aren't indigenous and it's it's a it's a kind avenue something we can't define which is reconciliation so yeah thank you Kui. Um, and so eudaimonia aims to achieve well-being through a multifaceted approach. The needs of the local community are at the front, forefront of what we find productive. Specifically, our work promotes well-being of communities, and we aim to co-create a vision for a trail system on Haida Gwaii, as well adopt a transformative model, like we said, within the design practice. We want to move beyond traditional client and develop developer-led relations that are purely based on profit. What if achieving well-being was our primary indicator of success? EM promotes well-being for communities in a multifaceted manner. This includes cultural well-being, the space for expression of language, art, song, dance, and sharing of food. Cultural safety is also a part of this. Mental well-being, the psychological, emotional, and social development for the community and those involved. Financial well-being, the ability to provide and create local jobs, entrepreneurial opportunities, and strategic programming. Physical well-being, the health of the people as well as the environment, including the air, water, and earth. So as you can see, well-being provides the underlying ethos of eudaimonia. Now let us consider the well-being of the earth at a local and global context. Soil, a vital substrate provides the building blocks and medium for life to communicate and grow. Or ground, an abstract term that designers use to differ differentiate surfaces of operation land a construct we do not own but belong to so do you own the land or does the land own you do you own the ocean or is it a part of you what about the air 
It contains a dense cloud of molecules that were once part of other beings, whales, turtles, dinosaurs, birds. Why don't we take in a deep breath? You are breathing in a zoological legacy. So we are guests on this land. And can we see it beyond capital, beyond real estate, beyond terra nullius, nobody's land, a Latin term um, used to justify claims that territory may be acquired by a state's occupation of it. So earth is a living being. It re represents the mother, our mother, mother earth. Our connection to the land and our connection to our ancestors ties all of our relationships to each other. And so now I wanted to share a video that um, one of our students, Jeremy, made for Eudaimonia um, to give a little taste of what Eudaimonia is about. He's here too, right? Yes, I think Jeremy is here. Hey, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to play. Okay, so now let's move on to how eudaimonia advances health equity and holistic well-being. Eudaimonia structures our operations through these four areas, models, modes, methods, and media. Models includes the way we fund our organization and how investments are directed. Um, modes applies to the different ways we've used our skills as designers towards collaborating with local organizations. Methods include um, design, teaching, and research. And then media includes a multifaceted approach to representation and communication. So the model of eudaimonia is based on partnerships, grants, and fundraising. And these all stem from the need to make social and political alliances at both the local and national level. We have made partnerships with local and regional organizations such as the Haida Gwaii Rec, um, Reation Society, the Council of the Haida Nation, Old Masset Village Council, UBC Sala, and um, as well as uh, a couple of other organizations not listed. Um, and what is most important is to continue nurturing the social relations um, one has with the individuals in charge of these organizations. Eudaimonia also applies for grants to fund our work. And this here is a sample of a couple of grants we've applied to. 
And we also have plans to hold fundraising initiatives later on this year, which includes crowdfunding or um, looking at philanthropy and asking companies and individuals whose mission aligns with the work we do. And now um, moving on to the modes we use to achieve well-being. This entails mentorship, new media, and design and skill building. These programs are formed through collaborations with local organizations to see what they are already doing and see how we as designers can share our tools and skills to best support the community's needs. So we have a animation and storytelling mentorship program that's just started with the old NASA Youth Center to provide cross-cultural learning and skill building for high school students in Old Masset. And the new media program partners with the Old Masset Emergency uh, Center to provide health-related notices and videos regarding COVID and issues on mental health. The skills building program partners with the Warriors um, program to provide youth leadership training and design and build opportunities. So I'm going to share a little video that describes what the um, Warriors program is about. We're up in the Nijin River watershed and um, it's an untouched watershed. It's, you know, it's majestic, it's beautiful, it's spiritual and uh, we're here today on our monthly camp with our house at Warriors. I really like Warriors. It's a really fun thing. We're up to, we're up to doing some hard work. We're going to make a cabin, make trails, cutting wood, keeping the fire going, set up our tents. We're learning to live in the wild. We've been at five or four camp trips, yeah. It was in September we started the House at Warriors and it was through Ricardo. Um, with my job, I went over to Itatsu and I got asked to, to go to their program and I was just so impressed, you know, with what I had seen from these young adults and I said to Ricardo, how long did it take you to do this? He says, over a couple of years. And I said, I want to do this in houses. At first I thought it was just a day thing, just one day thing. And then I read it more and then I said, oh, I like camping, so I start going to this, yeah. The person that told me about it was in it. She looked at me as like a leader, and so I took that chance to, you know, try to prove myself as a, as a leader. I never heard that before when I was a kid, so, you know, just to show them that it's, to have a lot of fun, it's all, that's all it's about. It's really important for them to get out there uh, physically, to actually touch, to actually take your, take your shoes off and, and take your socks off and feel the land, you know, feel what's been there. For, for, for thousands of years in our ancestors walking. I think it's fantastic. I'm surprised and excited at So as you can see from these three programs, Eudaimonia is utilizing the tools of the designer to, in support of the needs of the community to achieve well-being. So moving on to the different methods um, of engagement, storytelling, and design research. And this is all supported with um, the support of UBC Sala as we have students um, that we have talented students to help us achieve the work that we're doing. Um, in terms of engagement, uh, it happens on a one-to-one -one basis, as well as in larger context. Um, for example, this summer we will be going to um, Haida Gwaii to hold a couple of community engagement sessions. Um, and um, all of these relationships are built on trust. 
And so um, this here you see is a band council resolution that was passed by the Old Masset Village Council that officially states the agreement to work with Eudaimonia and UBC Sala to develop um, a vision for this trail system. And um, now I think, Kui, do you wanna um, move forward with the storytelling aspect of Eudaimonia? Central to humanity and creating our, our story, you know, and those and I think building access or building understanding of indigenous storytelling is uh, central to reconciliation and it's central to being human because it's a form of art and understanding like a, like a lot of the stories are really guidance through the human experience and they're they're quite profound uh when you start to look into them deeper and uh like i know i've spent a better part of my life studying Haida stories and it's been an extraordinary experience because as I experience my life, more is revealed to me about why these stories were put into place. So they're these complex um, entities that are uh, intangible, but they're there, that guide us through our life and guide us to understand the world that we live in uh, because it's, it's complex. And those are, are, I think, central to like once people start to understand the stories, it empowers you to make better decisions. But also, as far as Indigenous storytelling goes, it's a form of reconciliation because you're starting to learn the language and the, the expressions of the land that you live in. And those are, are I, I think, empowering, not just for Indigenous people, but all people. So, um, Storytelling through eudaimonia um, has been quite uh, rewarding and sharing these ancient stories to our students in the last semester created some spectacular expressions out of them like because they really kind of dove into it. Um, and it was really extraordinary to share with the students these stories um, and these concepts and these old ideas, this ancient living culture, um, you know, we saw them transform and they were able to create these incredible animations that touched the hearts of my, my people because they were able to dive into something that they weren't aware of. And like these students were from all around the world, you know, like name your, like, you know, we had students from China, we had students from Boston, we had students from, you know, LA, uh, like it was extraordinary to see them transform. And it was extraordinary to like watch them learn and kind of take in all this beautiful information. It was, it was rewarding. Cause like, I would say personally I was kind of losing my interest in this heavy study of my own culture, but the students brought me back in and, and I, I miss them all, you know? I miss all of them. Venezuela, you know? You know, like all of these, India, like we, we came together around this ancient living culture and I, it, was, it was like a kind place and a beautiful place to be to see the students transform through storytelling and through understanding. And uh, um, I think that's like the heart of reconciliation is, um, like I said, not indigenous people changing, but people changing around us to understand where they're at and what they're doing. Yeah, I think um, the studio experience last term really um, planted seeds of reconciliation within all of us. Um, and it kind of allowed um, me to see that 
the role of the designer is to use our skills um, to make room for um, human expression that inspire others um, to change. So Eudaimonia uses forms of media to represent and disseminate our ideas. And I'll be showing a couple of examples. Um, and our choice of media moves beyond how designers traditionally draw to include a more interdisciplinary um, approach. And so um, here are six videos that um, the class from last term made. And uh, Kui, did you wanna talk a little bit about these before I um, show, an, show a video? Um, I, I would say like the highlight for me these videos is that all of the students were able to access the language of our people through the Skidigit Haida Immersion Program or SHIP as we call it. And it really brought up the understanding, I think, and the the like the promotion of uh, uh, endangered language from people who aren't from that culture, I think was extraordinary. And the students' ability to kind of do a culture in a respectful way and like create these videos was, was quite beautiful. Um, and it was really refreshing to see the language kind of emerge from this. And, and I think that's something as you guys move forward in your own practice is like really look at the language of the land that you're on and where you're working and look at the indigenous people and find ways to design around that, which I think is really quite um, profound and maybe unseen until, you know, uh, today. And if you guys get the opportunity, I, I would recommend that you watch all of these videos because they're, pretty cool like they hit a lot of uh beautiful notions of what the world can be and how we understand the world and i'm just going to play one right now play a couple of maybe a minute of this one So you guys can take a look at um, the Lifeway Studios website for more of these videos, but I will move on to 
Does, does someone want to send the link in the chat, the group chat? For mm -hmm. can, can you do it or Jeremy or Chris? Yeah, it's just lifewaysstudios.org. I can, looks like it's just that one. Um, okay. I will have to go back. Oh. Um, and now I wanted to also show a Thank you, Chris. another animation that um, Jeremy and Hoi Yang made in terms of reframing how uh, traditionally um, the designers have understood scale. Um, as we as we all know, um, the powers of ten video by the Eames is something that you've probably seen in your classes quite quite often, but. Um, we've taken it and um, show it through the lens of Haida culture. So, so I'll play a minute of that as well. The basketball court in Old Masset Community Hall is the start of an exciting afternoon early May. We begin with a game time scene, one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now, every 10 seconds, we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. This square is 10 meters wide, and in 10 seconds, the next square will be 10 times as wide. Our picture will center on the basketball players, even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide, distance a Haida canoe can row in 10 seconds. Boats are docked in the marina and people are roaming the village. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters, the distance a zodiac boat can travel in 10 seconds. We see Masset village, an old Masset coming into view. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers, the distance a supernatural being can travel with ease. In 10 seconds, we see all of northeastern Haidabai and how the wind and ocean currents shape the tip of Nikon Provincial Park. Supernatural killer whales dwell in these surrounding waters. 10 to the 5th meters, the distance an orbiting satellite covers in 10 seconds. We pass through clouds above Haidabai in which cumulus cloud women could be found. A million meters. Soon the earth will show as a solid sphere. We can now see the earth and sky realms. We will now travel through the remaining four cosmological layers. After minutes long journey, the earth diminishes into the distance. The background stars are holes in the roof of the celestial house. This line represents the distance light travels in one second, half of the moon's tilted orbit. We can now see the arc of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. We can see the orbital paths of our neighbors, Venus, Mars, and Mercury. The Sun enters our field of view. You guys can watch the rest of that um, on your own time since I will be mindful of the time. Um, let's go back to presenter view. So um, another media that Eudaimonia uses is exhibition. Exhibited at the Bill Reed Gallery in Vancouver um, just this earlier this year for um, two months. And then Here's another view of the exhibit. Um, and then I wanted to um, also talk a little bit about art and multimedia and how that can bring well being and healing to communities. So, as part of the engagement sessions on Haida Gwaii this summer, we are asking participants to use photography to create a cultural mosaic that shares their individual experience and perspective of landscapes. This present project by Luke Parnell forges a contemporary Haida identity. Um, and this art piece here is an example of how we can use art to signify and record the community's transformation 
which is possible um, or which that is possible through future projects like the trail network. Um, Hui, did you want to share a little? Uh, I know Luke, he, he's Haida and Shimshian and uh, I'm quite proud of him because he uh, has taught at Emily Carr and he um, uh, has really made some innovative kind of pieces, but this one is, I think, celebratory of like the multiculturalism of the, the world we live in today that is um, uh, inclusive, beautiful, uh, sophisticated, and ancient. Uh, so he was able to kind of bring together some like really uh, beautiful concepts to create this piece. Um, I think he's in Toronto right now. Um, but uh, he's he comes from a very prominent family that is also connected to Bella Bella, like the Hiltzik, the Haida, and the, the Shimshian. And I think this is like speaks to all of those in a way, but it also speaks to the cultural mo mosaic and cultural fabric that we live in um, that is fun, exciting, and thoughtful. Uh, and I think if it can bring inspiration to you guys as students and the work that you do to be that inclusive and kind of bring all the people into the fold, whoever you are, uh, is uh, extraordinary for, uh, I think, your practice as you move forward. Thank you, Kui. So this is the final slide and I just wanted to leave it up here and um, we'll read it and absorb it, and then we can open up to questions. So thank you all for listening. Um, Can you stop sharing? So are there any questions or I guess that was a lot to absorb. Yeah, I can just start us out. Um, thank you both very much for coming and it was a very informative and great presentation. Um, I guess maybe we can, we in our one class, we use a stack method for questions. So maybe if you have a question, just write stack in the chat and then you can speak. Hey guys, um, good to see you guys again. Um, I know you guys um, mentioned uh, what you were doing later this year. I was wondering if you could just um, mention that again. What, what are you um, doing this summer? Uh, so we've been invited by the Old Nasset Village Council to go up in June to hold um, a couple of engagement sessions regarding on what the community wants to see for their trail system. And so, um, apparently everyone is, uh, everyone on island is getting vaccinated in the next two weeks. So, um, we just have to see what's required for visitors in June, um, to see what the, yeah, what, how, yeah, how we can go up. Are you coming, Jordan? <laughs> I wish, I wish. Yeah, it's good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you. <laughs> Yeah, Kui, you're going back to Haida Gwaii in a month's time. I'll be back home in my house uh, in a month, which I'm pretty excited about, but I need the city and, you know, Haida Gwaii. So it's, uh, 
sorry don't mind my dog he's really high maintenance um uh yeah so we're we're gonna go back and spend our time on the beaches and hiking the mountains and Haida Gwaii so it should be pretty extraordinary so I'm excited for Annie and Martin to come up and start doing this good work and kind of enlisting people like yourselves to uh participate in this kind of groundbreaking work I'm wondering if you can speak to this uh, when you founded the organization and sort of maybe a bit about the timeline and sort of the first steps to creating this nonprofit. So Eudaimonia, officially we signed and registered as a nonprofit um, in a year ago around this time. Um, and that was, uh, yeah, that was done a year ago, but before that there was a lot of like uh, trips to Haida Gwaii that I had made with Martin or um, who also led a um, studio uh, project or studio trip up summer studio abroad trip, I think three years ago. And so um, through conversations with um, the local artists as well as people from the council of the Haida nation it became evident that um, there was this need for um, not someone to tell the Haida what to do, but just to um, kind of orchestrate and like tie the programs um, that are existing and um, help them and co like help help the community co-create this vision. And so on my trips to Haida Gwaii, um, like three summers, two summers ago, there was always talk about this trail system that was going on amongst the community. And um, so through those conversations, um, I realized that what I was doing for my thesis project was already um, like being talked about in the community. And so it was just kind of making those connections with the locals. And then um, last year, we officially registered um, Eudaimonia as a nonprofit. And then we started writing grants and then I got the opportunity to teach at UBC. So things kind of just snowballed into um, these opportunities that just were like laid out in front of me and, and I would be silly not to take them or to go in that direction. Um, so yeah, I was working at a couple of offices beforehand. And so um, I wanted to start something um, that was more meaningful to myself and so as well as to like seeing what the needs are um, around me. Yeah. Yeah. So can you talk about that process of building relationships? And this is for Kui too, um, about how like relationships are maintained and like established and how we use those in our practice. Want me to go, Annie? Okay. Uh, like what I've found and what I've been told by my mentors in my life is that you're never loyal to an institution, but to the people that you work with. And so when you work with these people, you make good relationships because you never know where they're going to go or what kind of success they're going to have or, or non-success. Like maybe you're the successful one. Um, but like what I found is like building a network is just being kind to one another, sharing culture, maybe sharing food or coffee, like I think is really humane. But like a lot of it is just kind of keeping in touch. And like, I think social media is really a good um, avenue for it um, that, uh, um, you know, people need to take, like you, you need to, um, celebrate the people that you work with and the people you connect with. And it might be just through email, it might be social media, it might be a coffee once a month or dinner, like Annie and I have dinner like once a month or something, you know, with Martin and others. Um, uh, so it's, it's always keeping those contacts and keeping them in mind and making a great impression. And the, the, the kinder you can be, this the the intelligence and like 
the even the humor you can bring goes a long ways more than anything else because people will remember a joke forever um but they won't remember like a crabby face or or they might remember that too but they won't want to like connect with you so like most of my network has been built which is a very large network like it's coast wide it's city wide it's international um so just be yourself be kind be beautiful and keep in contact and and don't be afraid to to ask people for things because people are more willing to help than you think and i think through the avenues of social media we've been kind of separated whereas like i'm sure today if i needed help from annie she would like help me or like whatever you know like i have like contacts from 10 years ago that if i reached out to them uh they they would surely do what they could to like help me if that's what I needed. And so I think it's like building that community and not like once you leave like a company for whatever reason, oh, sorry, my dog is crazy right now, um, is, you know, just be loyal to the people that you work with and those relationships that you build and it, it doesn't have to be an institution or a place. It's just that like overall relationship and connection. And when you, if you are writing grants, um, call them first and uh, call them and talk to them and make that like relationship work before you even throw in the opportunity and like talk to them. And I found that to be very successful in my career is um, talking to them prior to ever like throwing in a grant, uh, especially if it's a big one. Um, it, it makes way more, it makes life a lot easier because grants are a lot of work and like a lot of writing. And so making those early connections I think are, are powerful. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, yeah, I think it's like the intention you bring to the conversations and the social relations that you make. I think um, being like your authentic self is something I always try to, try to bring. Um, and yeah, I think working, yeah, I think what Kui said was very, um, like the same process that I've encountered. And it's kind of like honoring, um, staying true to what you believe in, because like what you believe in will attract others that are also thinking along the same veins. And I think kind of just like sharing what you think is right will naturally attract the right people to work to work with you. And like not just defaulting to what you um, what your instructor tells you to do. It's kind of like finding your own voice in how you think design should be headed. Um, and something that I would like to encourage everyone to um, do more. Well, uh, I also think that like our class that we taught, like Annie and I were lucky enough to build beautiful relationships to all the students. And it's not a... Uh, uh, a hard thing to like reach out to any of them for like help or thoughts or ideas that um uh and and so you know stay in touch with your teachers and your classmates also because you don't know where they're gonna go either or how things are gonna be so like make those relationships while you can because we we actually it felt like a family like it was like all the cousins coming together yeah. in the end of our our class because there's only 13 students and annie and i and martin and we all built like a beautiful uh relationship and i think that can be quite quite powerful uh also yeah yeah, Chris and Jordan, I wonder if you guys have any thoughts on the class now that it's been a couple of months since um, the class ended. Oh, sorry, I've messed up the process and order of the questions. I see David has a question. 
Hey, I'm, I don't know what's going on with the video. Does it matter? Oh, I can't um, hear you, David. Oops. Can you hear me now? A little bit. Can you speak up? Yeah, let me check. How about now? I have, to, I have to put my ears really close to my computer. Okay. Um, I'll try to uh, speak loudly. So mm -hmm. awesome to see the work develop. I've been following your work since grad school. So mm -hmm. congrats to both um, Kui and you. And I'm curious um, if there's capacity to do this type of work um, at design institutions beyond UBC. Um, so I feel like there's a real thirst for this type of work. And I think you have a really unique program and seem, seems like you have a head start. I think it'd be a real inspiration to other design institutions. I'm just curious um, just what, what the temperature is for this type of work um, based on your experience. Hmm. That's a very good question, David. Um, yeah, I think UBC um, has created um, an equity diversity um, group. And so they're taking on more initiatives like this. But in terms of what other institutions, um, like if they have or works, um, and if there is support for this, I'm. That's a good question that I think I need to ask. Um, yeah, Kui, do you have some? Well, I know like SFU um, and UBC have like Aboriginal engagement plans, which are really kind of thick documents that have like way too many words, way too many concepts. And it's like a great, beautiful idea and they take two years to put it together. But actually kind of putting it in place has been, uh, I think implement uh, like implement it has been, uh, a struggle and I think through eudaimonia like we're able to kind of infiltrate some implementation through like one or two or maybe three facets of it um and I know other institutions like that that's the kind of hip thing to do now is reconciliation and like indigenous engagement but I think it's going to take a non-governmental organization like Eudaimonia to actually fast track it into uh, action because universities are like, you know, like Pepsi and Coca-Cola, like they're big, huge kind of institutions that moves much slower than something like Eudaimonia could bring. And like, that's where the power of like a non-governmental organization uh, is uh, really quite, um, impactful because there's a freedom that comes from a non-governmental organization that is different from big hu humongous kind of institutions and I think eudaimonia brings a lot of kind of freedom to expression that you know academia can't necessarily grasp because it's all about kind of bantering against one another, which I'm, I'm not an academic. I, I have a lot of academic friends. Um, uh, I kind of, you know, universities come to me to, to work with me. Um, but I, I also see the flaws because it's based on like ancient kind of systems, whereas eudaimonia is kind of fast tracking that kind of engagement in a way that is useful to design. So the model of eudaimonia can be taken and kind of implemented around the, the nation internationally. Um, and I think there are NGOs out there that are doing similar work, but I think this is quite unique through the animation class and engagement that we are uh, bringing to this type of work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I do think more institutions need to just trust, I guess, the people that are doing the work to do the work. Because I think even we, like Kui and I were supposed to have conversations with the university, but I think things just have slowed down because they have a million other things to kind of work on. Um, so it's definitely, I think, a slow, 
battle, I guess not, I don't want to call it a battle, a slow track towards finding new ways to do things. Because I know, David, you yourself, you just started teaching at um, Washington, Washington or Oregon? Yeah, a little University of Oregon. Yeah, how, how has that been for you? With, um, God, with on what them? level? <laughs> It's been great, but yeah, institutional um, momentum is, 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 doesn't exist. I mean, it moves at a glacial pace. So um, I hear you loud and clear in terms of just taking the initiative in your own hands and running with it and basically leveraging them as um, support, but not being beholden to them or held up. Yeah. Them. So um, it's a struggle, yeah. But I'm, I'm always inspired by people who just, they just go for it. And that's why I super appreciate the work. And yeah, kudos to both of you. Thank you, David. Yeah, I, well, I was inspired by your work while I was still stuck in uh, <laughs> corporate land. And then after our conversation um, at, at what, it was, what was that bakery in, um, in Boston, I think you inspired me to also just branch off and go do my own thing. Do your own thing. You never regret it. Yeah. And also work towards better pay. Students, uh, teachers aren't paid very well. <laughs> so, yeah, especially not adjuncts. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, trying to value your time and put it yeah. into an NGO is, and, and value that freedom is powerful. Yeah. I think um, I've spent way too much time on this, but um, I think. <laughs> and not not I haven't been paid for in my time but I think it comes back to me in other ways and so yeah it's worth the time and meeting wonderful people like Hui um, just continues to inspire me to do the work um, yeah because definitely I it's like a it's a learning I learned so much from like teaching the students last semester and even this semester um all um, eudaimonia move forward um, in a non like in a more lateral hier non hierarchical way. Yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> Awkward silence. So I guess one thing is that like a common theme that comes up in our class discussions is like mm -hmm. that relationship between like the client model and working for power. And I know we addressed it a little bit in the lecture, but like thoughts on beginning to do that work or like I know that it's difficult to find a firm that like if, if I want to do this work, my choices are to start my own thing where there's like four places, right? So I guess like the question comes down to like thoughts on inverting that client power model. Mm -hmm. And how you craft something of your own that goes against, well, yeah. So that's why like the nonprofit model is important and like working with um, grant writers to get funding in that capacity, but also like being creative and like finding people outside of design to um, work with is I think key. Um, so like, I think making friends from the, from different professions, like from the health profession, from business, from policy, I think that's where maybe conversations um, can start happening to see how you can work on like a new startup kind of um, idea. Um, and there's like a lot of other funding that's been given out to like tech related things. So I'm wondering if there's like more culturally um, engaged like philanthropists out there that we can tap into. Um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on? Uh, I can't really relate because I'm not an architect. Yeah. But like as like a tattoo artist, um, you know, I'm 
do, I'm creating something on someone's skin for the rest of their life, hopefully, if they don't delete it. But like, I, I actually spend the time to really get to know my clients before I per proceed in uh, creating pain and this like crazy experience and this forever tattoo on them. And I think that as you practice as an architect, you're making this kind of cultural impact on the, your client. So, so taking that, that time to really ask the good questions to your client will also create power. So you, I think you can have both. You can have your cake and eat it too, because I'm very powerful when it comes to tattooing because I have a huge amount of clients and a huge demand. And, um, but I'm also appeasing my clients. So I think you can have both and I'm empowering them and empowering myself at the same time. So I, that, that's kind of my conception because as architects, you guys are gonna make, you know, the world go round for certain people and you can, I think you can do both. Yeah, it's like identifying um, a common ground where like the final object you create is not like it's, it is the end goal for some, but it's more of the process and the um, way you go about achieving that end product, whatever that may be, a tattoo, a, a trail, a cabin, a garden. Um, it's like, how do you, um, like they're like, yeah, I guess it's like identifying a client and then finding ways to help support what that client wants to do that isn't just for, I don't know, like another, um, I don't know, another museum. Not, not that museums are bad things to make, but. But just, yeah, 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 I would say like uh, the success that I've had also, like um, I worked at the Haida Gwaii Museum and we created culturally sound curriculum. But it was interesting because the school district and the community had never worked together. So the museum actually served as like a third space, like a safe space for both to meet. So creating like a third space between you and your client where you're both kind of safe to communicate, I think is quite powerful. Mm -hmm. And like, it's really cool because the, like after that curriculum development, the, um, uh, now the school district in Haida Gwaii for the last 10 years works directly with the community because the museum was that bridge for mm -hmm. that communication. So creating that third space um, where uh, you and your client can work together, I think is very powerful in your creative process. And I don't know what that is. Like maybe it's a coffee shop that you meet at or like some sort of routine or ceremony that you go through um, can, can be quite powerful to um, build that third space, whether it's mental or physical, but uh, that, that will create, I think that's the arrowhead for success and uh, project. Yeah, yeah. And those are good questions that I will continue to think about, Chris. Um. Cool. Any more questions? Back. Well, I think it's one forty-five, so I think we're a bit over. Um, again, thank you very much, both Annie and we and Chris. Thanks for organizing this. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for your time and for your great questions. Um, this was really helpful for an exercise for us to do, to just like kind of um, re reflect on what we've done so far. Um, so thank you, Chris, for inviting us to give a talk today. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Awesome stuff. And thank you everyone for your time. It's really nice to share this time with you. Mm -hmm.
Thank you both. That was that was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. See, see everyone later in class or offline. <laughs> okay, bye.